Hi folks, it's Dr. Rob Sivers here. Happy New Year to all of you. And today's topic is really, for me, a very upbeat topic. It is to discuss the new dietary guidelines for Americans, the DGA, or what used to be the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, which are a um, position statement by the U.S. government that comes out every five years as recommendations of what the ideal nutrients and nutritional makeup is. And as you know, over the last uh, 50 years, we've taken a radical shift into a very non-human, non-physiologic set of recommendations that has been very toxic to metabolic health. And this is the first move to correct that. I was fortunate to be a recipient of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines recommendations from the prior committee that was supposed to come out in October of 2025. These guidelines come out every five years. Um, and a stop was put to that. It was not released. Now a new committee is formed. Um, and the we are going to go today through the new Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which is a complete reversal back to a physiologic approach and a more humanistic approach, taking re both religious agendas and industrially sponsored agendas out of the equation. So let's get into this. And in the first part, I'm just going to give you some of the history that we're reversing, what exactly did happen, and then we'll go through the specific first round guideline changes. And I want to thank... Uh, um, Callie Means um, and Dr. Tro Kalajian, who have provided some of this information uh, to me for this video. So let's start at the beginning. Around 1977, George McGovern was tasked with a uh, committee or a, uh, an inquiry to determine how to optimize nutrition support particularly for rural Americans. And the objective of the McGovern Commission was to solve hunger in America, to solve nutritional deficiency in America. In 1977, a lot of Americans, particularly living rurally, were undernourished and were fighting starvation on a regular basis. So the McGovern Commission was authorized to be convened to deal with provision of adequate food to Americans in 1977. Now, as this committee was formed, they also took into consideration and fell victim to, in my opinion, two major detractants. The first group was industry that was desperately in 1977 trying to move the spotlight of obesity, of cardiovascular disease, uh, primarily cardiovascular disease, away from the nicotine industry. And the nicotine industry shifted a focus toward fat, saturated fat being this awful product that is clogging our blood vessels, supported by lies in the literature uh, um, that had been published by um, several prominent nutritional authors telling us that fat was bad for us in a vegetarian, vegan diet, a low-fat diet was much healthier for us. The second part of industry was also now we started to see the advent of seed oils, polyunsaturated fatty acids, very unnatural in the human body, uh, seed oils in lieu of saturated fat, and a shift toward, again, a processed food, vegetarian, fructose, corn syrup, glucose-based diet away from fat. And uh, that particularly was driven by research, research in big quotation marks done by a guy called Ansel Keys. But really, the lipid phobia, the lipophobia, was promoted by the tobacco industry and then their secondary investment in food production and processed food. So that's the industrial sponsor. And simultaneously, we had, and, and there's a woman by the name of Belinda Fetke, her husband is Gary Fetke, a prominent ketogenic orthopedic surgeon, but I would strongly uh, advise you to go and look up Belinda Fetke's talk about the um, blue zones and about the origin of the Seventh-day Adventist church's promotion 
of a vegan vegetarian diet and it's the way that they religiously demonized the consumption of animal products and the way lifestyle medicine, ever in any time you hear the word lifestyle, you know that that is a Seventh-day Adventist-sponsored agenda. For example, Noom. Noom is heavily involved in promoting a vegan diet and Noom was about to go bankrupt until they discovered GLP-1s. So there is a huge narrative of a religious agenda telling us that veg vegetables and plant products are healthier than animal products. And it is a deeply situated agenda that talks about climate change, that talks about uh, human nutrition and health, and uh, demonizes the consumption of animals. So we've got, in 1977, we've got the beginnings of all of these things coming together to oppose and to fight against the standard American diet, which was actually pretty darn fat-centered and healthy through the 1950s and 60s. And if you look at photographs of folks, they were lean. There was a very, very low level of diabetes, and folks were of a normal weight. The problem was smoking and a food deficit rather than this ubiquitous abundance of processed foods. That was what started the McGovern Commission in 1977. So the focus on lipophobia, the fear of fat, and the danger of the fat were created by industry, some highly uh, um, unscrupulous physicians who were politically in charge, and by a religious agenda, not, 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 not by human physiology. And then that low-fat diet uh, approach was adopted by cardiology um, because they equated fat in the blood vessels with fat that we were consumed. And it's just grown and snowballed from there with the U.S. dietary guidelines since McGovern every five years putting out more and more of a vegetarian, low-fat, high-carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are innocent of any wrongdoing. And grass generally regarded as safe, fructose corn syrup, generally regarded as safe. That was the promulgations of the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Committee. So what's changing? Let's go through some of the first round of changes that are going to come out later this year, about a year late, but in 2026. And this is absolutely massive because one last comment. When you look at our fear of lipids, removal of lipids from our diet has significantly resulted in an increase in cardiovascular atherosclerotic, atherosclerotic uh, disease. So the lack of fat has promoted heart disease. The processed carbohydrates, especially fructose-rich carbohydrates and seed oils, have heavily promoted an epidemic rise in obesity, in dementia, in autism spectrum disorder, in type 2 diabetes, so a variety of health issues have surged, not only because of the lack of fat in our diet, but the replacement of fat with sugar. That's the background that the new, and they've changed the name, Dietary Guidelines for, for Americans, DGA, have now been tasked to reverse and change. Listen up, type 1 diabetics. In my opinion, it is malpractice to promote the consumption of carbohydrates in a type 1 diabetic and then cover it with insulin. The ideal is to stay away from carbohydrates, but even then you may have problems regulating, especially early on as you convert to a more carnivore-based carbohydrate, uh, low-carbohydrate diet. You may still have surges of blood sugar production by the liver and a degree of insulin resistance. Well, one of the best ways to combat that, and it's important to understand the difference, is to use ketone IQ. This is an exogenous source of ketones that drives you in ketosis. The key thing is this, that it is an alternative fuel source, but it doesn't replace insulin. You want to be using insulin to drive sugar into your bloodstream. If the energy supply is sugar plus ketones, at first from exogenous ketones, you significantly lower your insulin requirement. You treat that early insulin resistance because once you are insulin sensitive as a type 1, you need far less, far, far, far less insulin. And using ketone IQ, an exogenous source of ketones on a regular basis, reduces and stabilizes your blood sugar and makes you more insulin sensitive. Now, be cautious with dosing, but it is a radical way to give you energy when you don't want a bump in sugar and you can tolerate lower blood sugars, you definitely don't want to do this when your blood sugars are super high in lieu of insulin. 
If you're super high, you're in ketoacidosis. Don't add ketones to that. But if you're in a decent sugar range, but you're requiring a lot of insulin, ketone IQ will get you to lower your average insulin requirement while still keeping a normal, normal range blood sugar. Try it as part of your therapy, as part of your conversion, as part of getting rid of insulin resistance. So what has changed? Number one, religious and industrial agendas, people with two pages worth of industrial sponsors that sit on these committees where their uh, uh, agenda is driven by the support of their benefactors rather than human biology, they're gone. They're no longer on the committee. The committee is primarily made up of people who prioritize human biology. What foods in what various makeups ideally make us human, how we humans are defined by the food that we eat. And um, Callie Means is heading this up, and there are a few of us who are able to give uh, directives now. And obviously, it's a progression of change. It's not perfect, but it's a major first step in the reversal. So let's go through this. As opposed to the prior U.S. dietary guidelines, there is now a very strict, a very strict restriction on processed carbohydrates and sugars. And the GRAS status, the generally regarded as safe status of fructose corn syrup that industry has used to produce all of these so-called processed foods is being revoked. So we are revoking GRAS status for fructose corn syrup and radically restricting the use of processed carbohydrates and sugar in our recommended foods. Secondly, very importantly, the removal of all caps of all limitations on fat consumption. Very important. So there are no longer restrictions or recommendations of how much fat you should eat. Now, here's the bizarre part. Politically, and that's why I say this is phase one, this will change over time. But because this is such a radical change for people like cardiologists and the uh, industry-sponsored American College of Cardiology, industry-sponsored, they are a for-profit organization. You can look at some of my prior videos on this. American Diabetes Association, an industry-sponsored for-profit nonprofit. Hmm, okay. Um, so to appease some of these large-mouthed, erroneous, in my opinion, organizations, here's the bizarre part. While we, the, this new Dietary Guidelines for Americans has removed all caps on fat composition and fat in our diet, it still imposes a 10% saturated fat limitation, a recommendation that you should not eat more than 10% fat in your diet. Now, saturated fat. Now, saturated fat, for example, what does this mean? Two eggs and some butter already exceeds that. So it's a bit problematic. However, one of the ways to get around this is to use the first statement, and that is to remove all restrictions on fat, all caps on fat composition. So if you do that, you can then say you can eat as much fat as you want to. You're going to be just fine rather than breaking it down into saturated, polyunsaturated, and monounsaturated fatty acids. I think the focus here, though, folks, the focus should be on a radical restriction of polyunsaturated fatty acids, the seed oils, which are oxidized and manufactured as opposed to the naturally occurring in very, very minute amounts polyunsaturated fatty acids, like three omega fatty acids, six omega fatty acids. So if we go with a recommendation that fat is fine, we're good to go, and we somewhat ignore the 10% cap that has really been put in as a first step to appease and to allow the slow adopt uh, adoption of this by some of these other organizations. The next thing is that there's been a significant increase in recommendations for protein, particularly, and this is beautiful, particularly protein from animal sources, dairy, eggs, and meat, fish, poultry uh, organs. So um, a significant increase 
a 33% increase in the recommendations for protein. Now, it doesn't mean 33% of your diet should be protein, but there has been a significant, a 33% increase in protein that is recommended in these diets as a, faction, uh, as a fraction of total calories. The next thing that the prior many committees have never, ever owned and never, ever mentioned, despite the abundance of evidence, and now specifically, specifically low-carbohydrate diets, and we haven't yet said an exact number on that, but the mention of low-carbohydrate diets, typically accepted as less than 50 grams of net or 30 grams of total carbohydrates, but uh, a low-carbohydrate diets are specifically mentioned for the management of number one, obesity, number two, type 2 diabetes, and also type 1 diabetes, and number three, cardiovascular disease. So there is specific mention of the benefits of low-carbohydrate diets that were never previously mentioned. The 10% cap on saturated fat is still a concern for me, but you know what? I'm going to be the tortoise in this. This is a radical turnaround. And then I think the other very, very important part is the central role of diet in metabolic dysfunction. I know it's bizarre in this space, but we are recognizing now the central role of metabolic dysfunction that comes from diet in cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, a significant, massive first step redirection. Is this the last step? Heck no, it's not. But this is such a radical departure from the trends that were industry and religion driven from the previous 50 years that I am thrilled with this, happy to be a part of this, and will continue to fight for human physiology and human nutritional biology to be the exclusive reason we make recommendations. So look out for this, folks. It's a big deal. And in fact, in the next few videos, I'm going to talk specifically about various sources of foods that are good and bad and why that is so, so that you can start to create for yourself a more physiologically based, physiologically based diet or, new, or eating plan for the rest of your life. But this is big, hot, good news. The Dietary Guidelines for America 2026. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If you currently want a formulation of what an optimal diet is for you as an individual, not a societal, not a generic recommendation, um, give our practice a shout, 561-517-0642. From anywhere in the world, we will review who you are and where you are nutritionally and metabolically as a unique individual. Do you have heart disease? Are you trying to lose weight? Are you trying to manage your weight? Are you an athlete? Do you have diabetes, type 1 or type 2? How do we optimize your diet from a physiologic perspective to suit you as an individual based on where you currently are, not based on some generic algorithm. And we will look at you from a humanistic perspective, from a genetic perspective, and from a blood work perspective, and then design and modify the optimal biologic, metabolic, nutritional diet for you. Give us a shout, 561-517-0642, phone, text, WhatsApp, and set up a visit. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Thank you.